Welcome, everyone, to this episode of your Freedom Hub's Free Market Cash Patient Webinar. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with Charles Froman. We are sponsored by Freedom Hub, which is kind of the disruptive center there. We're going to explore that momentarily. We are recording all these for posterity, as you'll see. But before we talk about that, the gist and the purpose of our conversation is the fact that we've got a problem here, Houston, and it's pretty obvious. And the goal is for all of us as individuals and consumers to take back control. One of the key sponsors behind what we're doing is the award-winning WOW app, which allows you to be able to find and pay cash for patients and help facilitate the growth of the idea of cash doctors and cash patients. So that's going to be exciting. We've got a special website set up for that purpose. You can go there, take a look, see, watch a nice little video, learn a little bit more about it, and have a chance to chat to us a little more thoroughly. We do, as I said, have a place where we star, store all of this. So we've launched a very specific site that covers a variety of territory. It's the mphealthwealthfreedom.com website, or also available by us an acronym, mphwf.com. You'll notice there's a wealth of things under all these various drop downs you're going to want to explore away. One of the most important is, important is this home tab and underneath there you'll see information and events and continuing the conversation. Well, the information one is pertinent to what we're doing here today. This is the site where we tab within this and we kind of expose what's going on at the various shows. Here's a little thing about Brian. We'll come back to this in a minute. <clears throat> We also have another event on Thursdays, which is all about your financial activities and also how to get control of that for yourself. Future guests coming up. And then, as I said, we do links to all these old episodes. Here's all the various channels. Here's an example of the one up on Brighteon. I'm sorry, BitChute, I should say. And uh, you can see it just goes back a long way. There's some really fantastic ones. Doesn't matter if they're a week old or a year old. They're really typically very current. Here, in fact, is a little video for where the uh, inventor of that app is winning the award for innovation. Now, the other important part is the idea of continuing the conversation. So as a good example, we have a great talk today and we want to learn more about it as time moves forward. And, you know, you just can't keep watching this one little video over and over again. So we have the continuing the conversation area where you're going to be able to tap into and learn more about and stay engaged with that person. Here's a simple example. Well, you'll be able to find out more about what they talked about, get links directly to those videos. Maybe they had a PowerPoint presentation that you want to review, a blog site, and also importantly, the idea of legislation that's underway. So here's a perfect example where we continue the conversation in a more physical way. These are a variety of action items that you really do need to be cognizant of. They're timely. It's not like, should I do this one or that one, but really you need to participate in all of them. They're all little children of many of these organizations fighting for individual liberty and freedom and they need help in all various ways and different causes that they typically champion they can't champion everything but sadly as consumers we need to champion everything because all of these things affect all of us so on that note let's dig into find out what it is we have to deal with yet again here's something tonight we're going to have to deal with as individuals so brian's going to help educate us and help us move the needle a little bit so charles if you'll do the honors and introduce our guest tonight for sure jeff and welcome brian uh, this is a big deal tonight because trump doesn't get enough credit for reforming the healthcare system and when I was preparing this event, and given that you know Jeff and I commercially are engaged in disruption in the healthcare payment uh, system with a Forbes featured combination of sharing and HSAs with that cash appointments app, I realized that especially in three areas that Brian was involved. Number one, he Trump you know has forced hospitals to disclose prices. Two, he's broaden this uh, health reimbursement arrangement for employers to more easily give their workers benefits that the worker can possibly take with them. And third, he's 
in the course of broadening the health savings account to allow more deductions for different kinds of payment methods from not just insurance. All three of those are pretty rev revolutionary. And I think Brian will tell you he's a bit frustrated that he, he's not getting sufficient media attention for this good news because these changes are more revolutionary and helpful for entrepreneurs and healthcare than Obamacare ever was that Biden was a, a part of. So these facts have to be part of the debate. It's very impactful for the election. Um, Brian will talk also about the reforms going forward that Trump is probably going to propose. And, you know, Brian's the right guy to do it. Like I said, he was involved in the rulemakings over the past few years in the White House uh, as a special economic advisor to the White House with the National Economic Council, National Security Council. He's got a background at Mercatus and on the Hill with various uh, policy committees that the parties run. Um, so I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion, uh, Jeff, because the reforms fit right into the disruptions that were commercially pursuing. And, you know, we have a big event tomorrow morning with the Rosetta <laughs> Breakfast folks to talk more about that. So that's my intro, Jeff. Quite a good one at that. Brian, I'm going to hand you the screen here. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Charles. That was a very kind introduction. Um, and it's great to be with everyone this evening. Uh, some of my favorite people uh, are on the call or on the presentation. Uh, Grace Marie Turner, who I work with at the Galen Institute. Uh, Cynthia Fisher, who uh, is doing great work at Patient Rights Advocate, really uh, uh, leading a lot of the efforts uh, around price transparency. And then uh, my friend Dean Clancy, uh, who has taught me so much about the importance of HSAs and how we need to expand them. Um, I'm going to take uh, maybe 20 minutes uh, tonight and sort of walk you through uh, what I think are the key achievements of the Trump administration on health policy and then spend some time uh, on the choice uh, that we face uh, uh, in the direction um, that we can go if we get a uh, Biden administration or if we have a second term uh, for the president. Uh, three weeks ago, I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago with everything that's happened uh, in the last three weeks, but three weeks ago, the president uh, gave a speech in Charlotte where he announced the American First Health Care Plan. And the overarching aim of this plan has been what we've been working uh, uh, directionally on for uh, three and a half years. And it's eliminating government-erected obstacles to patient control uh, and medical professionals' ability to best treat their patients. Uh, you know, really, when, when the president took office, the number one uh, problem that we were looking at is uh, Obamacare and how to provide relief to people and small businesses that have been harmed by Obamacare. Uh, and we really, I mean, we worked hard on that. We worked with Congress um, and some of the initial actions uh, that, that we did and I'll speak about sort of uh, came out of uh, those efforts. Um, but the uh, reforms are much broader uh, to the healthcare system than addressing Obamacare's failures and really create uh, incentives and structures that are going to lead to, I think, fundamental improvements and efficiencies uh, in our healthcare sector. So there's three main aspects of, of, of the plan. Uh, the first is more choices, the second is lower costs, and the third is better care. Um, really, we started off the bat uh, focused on expanding choices. And uh, I have on the slide here, a uh, list of sort of the main uh, uh, achievements in that direction. The first was the elimination of the individual mandate tax penalty uh, that uh, penalized people that didn't purchase the uh, what Washington deemed as the right type of coverage. Uh, then um, the president signed an executive order uh, just about three years ago, and this was after uh, the congressional efforts all sort of all petered out dealing with uh, uh, reforming uh, the ACA. Um, it put in place three actions. The first was an expansion of association health plans. Uh, there, uh, we addressed the problem that small businesses were increasingly not offering coverage. Uh, we opened up a new pathway for small businesses uh, to offer coverage to their workers and get economies of uh, scale and sort of regulatory advantages. Um, the second was an expansion of something called short-term limited duration plans. These are uh, affordable, flexible coverage alternatives 
um, that have existed for decades that the Obama administration restricted uh, as they were trying to uh, uh, force everyone into the exchanges, which the Trump administration opened up. Um, and then there is an expansion, and it, this uh, uh, happened more recently, an expansion of plans that can be linked to health savings accounts. So one of the problems uh, is uh, the, the number one problem with uh, HSA policy is that too few plans can be integrated with HSAs. Uh, one of the restrictions was that HSAs couldn't pay for uh, preventive services below the deductible unless they met a pretty stringent uh, list from the IRS. And what we did was uh, expand that so that uh, people could access preventive care, preventive treatments like uh, uh, insulin for diabetics. They could have a plan that covers that before the deductible and that plan could still be linked um, to an HSA. So that rule uh, was finalized last year. Uh, there's been a significant expansion of telehealth. Um, again, this uh, really, uh, uh, the expansion happened with the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, but expanded seniors' ability to receive care in the comfort of their own home, over the phone, or through video. Um, and for the remainder of the coronavirus public health emergency, doctors can now be paid for providing virtual care, which in many cases is safer and faster. Um, and then the last one, which uh, Charles mentioned, uh, health reimbursement arrangements. I'll spend a little bit more time on that in a second. Um, the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House estimated the net economic benefit of the elimination of the individual mandate penalty with um, uh, the expansion of association health plans and the expansion of short-term limited duration insurance. Uh, and they uh, uh, estimated that the annual benefit from opening up those choices is $45 billion per year. They said is one of the um, uh, most impressive uh, deregulatory efforts in modern history. On to HRAs or health reimbursement arrangements. Uh, what the administration did here, I think, has the potential um, uh, to be one of the most important and long lasting um, actions of the administration. So most employees, most people get insurance through the workplace if they're under the age of 65. One of the problems with that is that the employer is choosing the coverage for the workers. Um, so it reduces the choice that workers have. And if you think about it, um, in, uh, given how important health care and health insurance is uh, for individuals only to be presented with a single option uh, or two or three options that their employer provides, um, we, don't, uh, we don't have those limited choices with anything else. What the HRA rule does is allow employers, instead of picking the plan, to provide a contribution that allows the workers to go into the individual market and pick coverage that works best for them. Um, it's going to increase the portability of coverage, so coverage will be more likely to last after people um, uh, leave their place of employment. Um, the projection. So we modeled, the uh, Department of Treasury modeled uh, what the impact of this rule is going to be, and they said it's going to take about five or six years to sort of reach its uh, uh, peak power. Um, and at that point, there's going to be about 800,000 employers that offer these individual coverage HRAs, and more than 11 million people enrolled in the individual market with an HRA. Um, it'll expand the individual market by 8 million people. And here, I mean, I often use a contrast with um, Obamacare. The size of the individual market is only about 2 million people more than it was pre-Obamacare. And we're spending about $50 billion a year in subsidies. So that works out to about $25,000 per newly insured person in the individual market. If you go back, Obamacare was largely about uh, a more robust uh, and improve individual market for middle class families and uh, uh, for, for businesses. And it has not worked out like that at all. Um, the Trump administration's rule will add four times as many people to the individual market as Obamacare did with no new federal spending as employer contributions or leverage. Okay, moving to uh, this next item, lower costs. Um, so what's the Trump administration's health care plan? You probably heard the Trump administration doesn't have a health care plan. I mean, this is, I've been dealing with this um, since I was still in the administration. And I uh, calmly uh, point out to reporters 
um, that actually the administration released a 120 page detailed plan on how to reform America's healthcare system. Um, and this is the cover for that plan. Um, what was that plan? What are we trying to address? Uh, well, the main thing we're, we're focused on is um, uh, sort of the, the, the sad fact that the last few decades have witnessed a massive transfer of wealth from the American middle class to the healthcare industry. Here, you can see just over the last decade, um, uh, this is uh, information from the Kaiser Family Foundation on employer premiums. Employer uh, premiums for employer provided coverage have increased $8,000 over the past decade. This um, is directly coming out of uh, worker wages that they would otherwise earn. And you can see here um, the growth in premiums over the past decade and the growth in deductibles have far outpaced um, uh, workers' earnings. Um, unfortunately, you know, the vast majority of the work, worker earning increases over the past really several decades have gone into healthcare costs. Um, back to the choice and competition report. Um, it is, we did this uh, in order to sort of lay out a blueprint for how conservatives and libertarians could think about reforming our healthcare system by relying on the principles of choice and competition and really addressing um, three main problems. The first is that there's excessive third-party payment in healthcare, 90% of uh, our spending goes through third-party payers, either through government bureaucracies or through insurance companies, and there are significant barriers to consumers and employers being more effective shoppers. Uh, the second are government rules that limit uh, choice and competition. And here you can think about certificate of need laws um, where you can't expand uh, capacity or supply unless you get the permission of a government board that is often dominated by the existing um, uh, incumbent firms in the market. Uh, you also have you know, narrow scope of practice requirements um, that uh, reduce competition between um, healthcare professionals. And then finally, uh, what we're seeing um, over the last uh, uh, decade um, and really before that is growing consolidation. So this is a figure from the Choice and Competition Report that shows the pace of hospital mergers ticking up since 2010. Uh, really, this is one of the problems, the horizontal uh, consolidation. We also have vertical consolidation, um, which is a problem with hospital systems buying up doctor practices. And then you get um, the problem of sort of referrals within the hospital system and a lack of competition um, between uh, different uh, uh, medical practices. Uh, four chapters in the Choice and Competition Report. Uh, the first one, uh, healthcare workforce and labor markets, their recommendations were, um, and I said there were over 50 recommendations in this report, uh, mixed between recommendations for the federal government and for states. Um, the uh, healthcare workforce and labor markets recommendations, uh, some of them were to expand the scope of practice, improve workforce mobility, uh, make it easier for uh, medical practitioners to travel between states. Uh, expand telehealth and reform graduate uh, medical education. On the healthcare provider markets, uh, repealing uh, certificate of need laws, uh, moving towards value-based models, and site neutral payments, which is something that I'll come back to. Um, healthcare insurance markets, again, expanding the types of coverage that people have um, by reducing government mandates on that coverage. And then uh, finally, um, and probably the most dear to my heart, uh, consumer-driven health care, giving workers more control over their health care dollars. We've already talked about HSAs and H uh, RAs uh, utilizing um, innovative models like reference pricing um, that have been shown to incentivize good consumer behavior, uh, a lower costs uh, without any, um, any negative impact on the quality of care, um, and then expanding price and quality transparency. Um, the uh, main uh, sort of uh, initiatives on lower costs, uh, there have uh, many of Obamacare's taxes have been repealed. So the health insurance tax and the medical uh, innovation tax, the medical device tax have been repealed. Uh, the Trump administration has uh, approved uh, many uh, state waivers uh, to set up uh, 
risk mitigation programs um, and has uh, put out guidance that allows for more innovative state waivers, really trying to um, uh, take advantage of federalism and get states to be more innovative. Uh, price transparency requirements, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, limiting uh, and preventing surprise billing. Uh, the administration has uh, tried to uh, prevent um, uh, uh, the surprise bills that happen when people go to an in-network facility um, and get uh, balance billed um, because they're treated by an out-of-network provider. So some requirements on uh, both transparency and on uh, limiting uh, the ability of providers to balance bill in certain circumstances. Uh, encouraging state-based reforms, like I mentioned, like eliminating con laws. And also, and I think this is important, um, using antitrust tools. Um, to combat consolidation. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, providing assistance um, and support uh, to the efforts of the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division at the Department. Okay, this is, um, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, specifically on healthcare price transparency. Um, I often call this Healthcare Executive Order 2.0. So the first one was the choice and competition executive order that led to association health plans, short-term plans, uh, HRAs, and the choice and competition report. Actually, the last week I was in the White House in Ju uh, late June 2019, the president signed an executive order on healthcare price transparency. Um, the president is has excited about the actions in this executive order as I've ever seen him on healthcare. He thinks uh, American uh, patients and employers have a right to know what prices are and what the quality is of the uh, medical providers uh, that they're utilizing. The price transparency just makes sense to the American people. Um, nearly nine out of 10 people, when asked, believe that uh, healthcare prices should be disclosed to them in advance of their receiving care. Um, and I mean, what do we know about shopping? We know that uh, the benefits to shopping accrue under two main conditions. The first are for services uh, that are large parts of our budget. And the second are when there is wide price variation um, among our alternatives. We know that healthcare checks both those boxes, right? It's approaching 20% of our national income. And it is well known that there are wide price variations um, within, even within regions, certainly across regions, but there are wide price variations within regions. Uh, you know, it's estimated that uh, there's uh, approaching $1 trillion of waste in U.S. healthcare spending, spending that doesn't do patients any good. Um, and really, I think uh, uh, price transparency is crucial uh, to uh, providing the information that consumers and employers need um, to be better shoppers and to put pressure on providers to become more efficient. Uh, so the uh, four main benefits of healthcare price transparency, and I should point out, I did a paper on this a little over a year ago where I reviewed sort of all the academic studies that I could find um, and did an analysis of the benefits of price transparency. Uh, and these are the four that I came up with. Uh, the first are better informed uh, consumers and patients. Um, a lot of consumers and patients never meet their deductible, so they face the full price for their healthcare services, and having uh, abundant price information will help them be better shoppers. Um, but I really think um, the more fundamental impact of price transparency is to help employers uh, in two ways. One is to help employers established models like reference pricing. And in reference pricing, uh, uh, the payer will set what they're going to pay um, regardless of the provider chosen. And it's a really good way to get your uh, employees to start shopping because they know if they go to a high price provider, they're gonna be on the hook for the difference. Um, so reference pricing causes workers to start shopping, understandably so, the neater effect is that it causes the high price providers to lower their prices. They don't want to lose patients. Um, so they lower their prices an average of 
uh, where we've had shop where we've had this and you're looking we've had this for like shoppable services like um, orthopedic procedures um, imaging labs uh, cataract surgery colonoscopies um, where you're getting significant savings um, the second main benefit to employers is that it helps them monitor the agents that they've hired um, to work on their behalf. I have become convinced that health insurance companies have failed. Um, employers have gone along with sort of this um, discount. They set up a charge master, and then there's a discount off of the charge master. There's sort of this scheme, and employers need better tools to monitor the agents um, that they've hired uh, to, to do a lot of this um, thing on their behalf. And finally, I think um, it'll just put public pressure on high cost providers. Some of the uh, prices are, um, once they are, uh, that'll put pressure on the high price providers. Okay, uh, that is price transparency. A few more uh, subjects, Medicare reform. Um, and this is really an administration success story. Uh, the uh, the changes to Medicare Advantage. There's been a 34% decline in Medicare Advantage premiums since 2017, um, and there are more than 1,200 additional plan options available to seniors uh, buying uh, buying uh, shopping for Medicare Advantage plans. Um, the second um, big Medicare reform I want to mention is moving to site neutral payments. Uh, and here, there are, um, there's a problem when you've got a physician office um, that does a procedure and the exact same procedure is done in a hospital outpatient department and the hospital outpatient department getting 40% more than the physician office. What does that lead to? That leads to consolidation where those physician practices um, sell to the hospitals and the hospital take them over and um, turn them into hospital outpatient departments, outgrowths of the hospital. Uh, what the administration has successfully done, and this has been upheld in the courts, is reduce Medicare payments um, for evaluation and management services provided in a hospital outpatient department. So the payments that match what's received in doctor's offices, really helping here independent doctors um, so that they're not at a significant disadvantage um, to the hospital. Um, the administration also expanded the services. Ambulatory surgical centers are alternatives to hospitals um, for a, a variety of uh, uh, procedures and services. They expanded um, and continue to expand um, what can be done in ambulatory surgical centers. Um, drug pricing. Uh, administration's had successes here as well. Uh, the first two years of the administration um, uh, within that period, we actually, there was a one year period where we saw a decline in um, net drug prices. And a lot of uh, this is attributed to uh, generic competition um, and a, sort of a surge of uh, FDA approvals of generics at the beginning of the administration. Um, and still over the course of three and a half years, drug price inflation is quite low. Um, so that's the record. The president um, in the uh, sort of recent executive orders has also made clear that one of his priorities um, is to reduce the disparity between what Americans pay for pharmaceuticals and what individuals in other countries pay. Uh, the last um, component, uh, and I'll just sort of go through these uh, uh, fairly quickly. The better care, uh, the president, um, these are all uh, referenced in the executive order that the president signed three weeks ago. He has his pre-existing condition pledge. The president has been firm that he's going to support um, pre-existing conditions. Um, if you read the executive order, um, the executive order makes the correct um, point that Obamacare was one way to deal with pre-existing conditions, but it was not necessarily the best way um, there's a lot of collateral damage from the way that Obamacare um, dealt with uh, pre-existing conditions. Um, uh, but regardless of what the president does, and I'll talk about um, a, a proposal in a sec, um, he would protect pre-existing conditions. Um, the administration has removed paperwork for burns, interference between doctors and patients, uh, eliminating uh, an estimate of up to 40 million hours of wasted time. Uh, the administration is making it um, easier for people to 
control their medical records. Uh, one of the most exciting initiatives that the administration did was around kidney care. So the president um, signed an executive order again uh, last year that uh, had three aims. One is to reduce disincentives to donations. The more people donate kidneys. Um, the second is uh, the development of an, uh, an artificial, artificial kidney. And the third is moving away from dialysis in institutions because that's what Medicare has reimbursed. We've set up a model for, um, for that type of dialysis away from that model to in-home dialysis, um, where it'd be much more convenient for individuals. Uh, and then the president has also, also talked about VA choice, expanding options for veterans. That's very important to the president. Uh, the right to try legislation to allow uh, very ill individuals to access experimental treatments um, that may significantly um, improve or extend their lives. Um, and then we talked about uh, telehealth. Um, okay. So let me take about uh, three more minutes and contrast um, uh, the Biden approach with the Trump administration. Approach in a second term. In the primary, uh, the Democrats uh, fought about Medicare for all and building on the ACA. Um, I have to tell you that I used to go on uh, radio. I've gone on radio, you know, back from the ACA path. And we talk about the problems in the ACA. And I would typically get the question at the end of the interview, didn't the Democrats just build this to fail so that they could move on to Medicare for all? And I always um, uh, said, no, they're working really hard to implement the ACA. I don't believe that they designed it. They're doing legal jujitsu uh, to implement the, the ACA. Um, and then we had this year's primary debate and they uh, have half of their party that's moved away from the ACA onto a total government control of healthcare. Now, Joe Biden um, didn't have that approach. He had building on the ACA, uh, but I think his, his plan certainly um, could lead to with the public option um, and sort of even more Medicaid expansion could lead us to, um, uh, you know, would, would certainly significantly increase the federal uh, government's role. In our Vice President Biden would make the subsidies uh, for Obamacare plans more generous. Um, he would expand the eligibility of those subsidies. And importantly, he would allow people with an offer of affordable employer coverage to um, opt out of the uh, employer coverage and to enroll in, um, in the exchange with a premium tax credit. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Uh, he would also increase direct subsidies to insurers through a federal reinsurance program. And he would establish a public option. And a public option is where the government is operating as the health insurance company. They are collecting premiums and they are setting payment rates. Uh, one of the problems here, a big problem, is how Medicare sets payment rates. They set payment rates in a very um, political process that discourages innovation. And I have a recent piece out last week on a major problem with how Medicare uh, payments discourage innovation. Um, and it would allow uh, low-income people in states that haven't expanded Medicaid to enroll in the public option plan free of charge. One of the main problems with the, uh, Vice President Biden's plan is that it would be very disruptive to employer-sponsored and companies. Jacobs, who's a healthcare expert, uh, wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last month that titled, Your Company Health Plan Isn't Safe in a Biden Presidency. And it's because of um, the fact that they would allow individuals to um, turn down the employer coverage and opt in to the exchanges. One, it's very expensive. The subsidies for the exchange are very expensive. But it's also gonna to lead to adverse selection in the employer plan. So um, the individuals most likely to leave are uh, lower income, but they're also younger and healthier. So as they navigate out of the employer plan, the employer plan is left with um, uh, people with more expensive medical conditions, which raises the price um, of the employer plan and makes it less likely that the employer can continue. Um, 
So Chris, in his analysis, estimated 24 million would lose coverage. Avalar Health estimated that 18 million migrate to the exchanges voluntarily. They're getting a better deal in the exchanges, um, but another 14 million are forced out of their employer plan because the employer stops offering coverage. So they estimate a total loss of employer coverage of 32 million. Um, the subsidies are incredibly expensive. Uh, it would more than double the projected cost of Obamacare over the next decade, uh, would make it $2.2 trillion over the next 10 years. Um, and it would significantly increase employer taxes through the employer mandates uh, because uh, people that access the subsidies, the employer has to pay a penalty. Um, I do think um, this is uh, going to cause some consternation within the Democratic Party. Um, given that uh, the, the Biden plan is really about increasing subsidies to health insurance companies, that $2.2 trillion um, is just going to health insurance companies through expanded subsidies. And uh, if you listen to some of the rhetoric of um, Democrat politicians on the left, like Bernie Sanders, um, they are casting insurance companies as evil. Uh, and I, I think that's going to cause um, some division within the Democratic Party um, going forward. On the other side, a um, uh, different approach that doesn't centralize more power in Washington um, and expand the role of the bureaucracy and the health insurance companies. Uh, that there's a health care choices proposal. Uh, Grace Marie Turner at the Galen Institute has really uh, been leading this effort for the past three years to get consensus. Among, um, among groups on the center right around a policy that would um, expand uh, choices of people for coverage. It would codify a lot of the actions that the administration has taken on um, you know, expanding uh, HRAs and HSAs and short-term plans and AHPs, and it would uh, codify the price transparency requirements. And it would repurpose Obamacare's money. Um, so instead of it uh, running uh, directly to health insurance companies, we would go to states and we'd allow states um, to set up programs that are best for uh, people in, in those states with certain conditions. They would have to spend a certain amount um, subsidizing private coverage. They'd have to spend a certain amount um, subsidizing uh, coverage for low income uh, people. Um, and they'd get some flexibility around uh, certain ACA rules um, but not around sort of the pre act uh, provision of the ACA. Finally, um, and uh, I wrote a piece with Lan He Chen at the Hoover Institution on what a second term uh, Trump agenda would look like. Again, there's a lot of overlap between what I wrote, or what we wrote in this piece with the healthcare choices proposal. Uh, we'd codify all the actions on expanded coverage options and price transparency. We'd permit every American, every American to have a health savings account. We would get rid of the um, uh, the uh, rules that restrict uh, people to only have a certain type of plan to benefit from health savings accounts. Uh, we would um, uh, increase um, attention to uh, anti-competitive mergers and consolidation, and ensure all Americans have access to telehealth and other emergency technologies, um, give states tools um, and resources to improve their individual markets, and finally, uh, you know, federal health care programs need reform. Um, Medicare needs reform. Uh, Medicaid needs reform. And I think one of the most important Medicaid reforms is to equalize the payment rates across populations. Because of Obamacare, we've created a bias toward able-bodied working age populations at the expense of traditional Medicaid populations who the federal government reimbursed lower for, um, less for. And I think that's a problem um, that, uh, that, that needs to be right. With that, uh, this is a list of uh, what I've written in the past year, um, research papers, um, many published by the Galen Institute, uh, some health affairs articles, uh, and with that, happy to have a conversation. Okay, very good. Well, that was very nice. I appreciate that. Um, let me zoom out of there for a second. Okay. Um, Looks like you have a lot of great threads going there for sure. And it's nice to see what it potentially is gonna happen in the next uh, four years. Although sadly, it looks like everything's dependent on what happens on one particular day and then we either go one direction or the other. 
it's it's amazing how fate can swing so quickly in just a moment in this country the way things work we've got some great hands up so let's see what we've got in store for us Kishore I see your hand up first you hear me yes um, so I have uh, I have questions about um, Medicare which uh, is sort of like the center of the universe um, which uh, plays a major role in price distortions. Um, so I, I find it kind of odd that um, the elderly cannot, ha cannot continue to save in their HSA account. Uh, there is of course uh, a very obscure program called the Medicare Savings Account, of which for some reason uh, people don't use. But even there, you, you can't really put in additional money there. Uh, it's, uh, the government puts in some money there, whatever you've uh, contributed in the past, uh, it puts money there. And then you, you spend on Medicare Advantage programs. Uh, if, if that were to expand, then I, I can uh, foresee that uh, the price uh, making power of Medicare would diminish. Uh, and as long as Medicare has this um, ability to distort prices, uh, there, there are ripple effects on consolidation and the rest of it, uh, a whole bunch of inefficiencies that come in. Uh, so, so my question then is, you know, uh, why this um, lack of um, emphasis on Medicare reform? Um, so I think the uh, uh, one, I agree with you. So I think that everybody should have health savings accounts. And by every American, I mean, people over the age of 65 should have uh, health savings accounts, be able to contribute to those as well. Um, the administration has done a lot uh, with its executive authority on Medicare. So the reforms to um, uh, the uh, say neutral payments between hospital outpatient departments and physician offices. If they, they went as far as they could um, there, and um, they've also made reforms to 340B um, to reduce the abuse that happens with 340B hospitals. I can tell you, I did a paper last week that looked at um, uh, Medicare's uh, role with how they set physician fee schedule, to how they set physician payments. And Medicare sets payments just looking at inputs, right? They estimate what the physician's time is, and they make some adjustments for, you know, how complicated a procedure is, but they base a price on um, the, the, the time that it takes to do something. Well, what happens when you get a technology that reduces the amount of time or can replace um, the role of a physician? And there is such a technology um, to uh, diagnose diabetic retinop retinopathy. Um, there's an autonomous uh, uh, artificial intelligence that uh, diagnoses uh, for, for people that have diabetes, whether they have this condition um, uh, that is you know, called diabetic retinopathy. Uh, it's much cheaper and it is much better than getting a clinician uh, diagnosis. But Medicare is having a difficult time figuring out how to reimburse for it. This is exactly what we need to figure out how to do if we're going to have technology that lowers prices and improves quality of care. So I'm hopeful, I mean, uh, that the Trump administration figures this, figures this out and, and uh, reimburses this. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, Medicare needs fundamental reform. Super. Paula? Let them mute yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You I are. Think. Hi. There how are you? are you? Oh, terrific presentation, uh, Brian. I've always read a lot of your stuff. Um, you know, um, as I've been growing my network of, of UberDoc, which is a direct access, uh, direct pay platform of specialists, and our our network has grown enormously in this last year since COVID. Maybe people aren't really seeing that the doctors are actually um, a lot of them are going back into the independent workforce. Uh, we have a lot of um, doctors that are kind of have time on their hands because the hospitals have kind of cut back. Uh, there's fewer patients going. Um, you know, we've had a massive dropout of, of doctors, as you know, especially women in, 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 physician, in uh, medicine. And um, the concept of telemedicine now is going to kind of reinvent medicine in terms of the stay-at-home doctor. I like to call it the stay-at-home doctor. So we could actually have a huge 
influx of doctors back into the workforce. Now, what will make this happen is the transparent pricing. Because transparent pricing will, will basically, you know, increase the transparency, the health savings accounts, and will create that marketplace that has to exist between a doctor and a patient. My question to you is that with this perfect storm, you have a workforce of doctors that is more than willing to be transparent. I mean, they will, you know, 100% of doctors will vote to agree to price transparency. You have health savings accounts expanding. Um, is there any thought for federally funded HSAs for the poor or for vets? In other words, why wouldn't we look at the, the, the patients on the fringes and offer them vouchers for their health care to let them have more choice? It'd be incredibly popular. It'd be a lot cheaper than an ACO because the ACO models are, are disastrous, right? They, the, head, the health centers can't even stay above water right now, um, just keeping up with a lot of the regulations required to get these payments. So I think that there's so much of an opportunity for creative new healthcare to match this new economy that's emerging, that's tech-driven, that's independent, you know, that, that removes kind of the middleman in so many things. People are reinventing themselves with 1099s and consultant positions. I think that this is like the perfect moment to really expand those HSAs and perhaps. So I'm just wondering, has any thought been ever given to federally funded HSAs for the poor or for the vets? Yes. Great question. Um, and thanks for all you do. Appreciate the uh, kind sentiments as well. Um, I've had uh, recently several conversations um, with, uh, with different people. Um, Dean Clancy, for one, um, at the uh, Americans for Prosperity, um, and uh, Cynthia Fisher and, and, and Grace Marie Turner and others about uh, uh, funding for HSAs for lower income people. Personally, from a policy perspective, one of the things that I really want to do is um, take all this. I mean, I would love to take all the subsidies that we have in healthcare. I mean, this is sort of a very aspirational, um, but all the subsidies that we have in healthcare, which are gigantic, um, and instead of subsidizing uh, health insurance companies and hospitals, we subsidize patients and consumers. Um, and then let them choose what works best for them. Now, uh, obviously, the healthcare industry is not going to like it if we don't directly subsidize them. Um, but I think on the margin, it's exactly what we should push for. Um, and I love the idea of subsidies to lower income people because Obamacare has these. They have these cost sharing reduction um, subsidies that go to insurance companies for insurance companies to reduce deductibles and co-payments. Well, instead of that, why don't we just uh, give the person an HSA and put the equivalent amount of money in the HSA for that individual so they can choose um, what's best for them. And then if they're cost conscious, it um, uh, you know, builds wealth for them over time for when they really need um, to, to use medical care. That was, yeah. really, that was good. In fact, you know, that's really what does happen, having seen that myself and worked in minority communities. The minute they have control of the dollars, they're as frugal as any other person ideally would be. It's when stuff is seemingly free that this stuff gets overused. Charles, I see your hand up. Uh, thanks, Jeff and Brian. Fantastic presentation. I wonder if you could comment on the tre Treasury IRS HSA rule outstanding right now that would allow deductible withdrawals for both direct primary care and sharing communities. Uh, I know some communities that we work with, um, Sidera and, and, and Zion, they're newer and they're not religious or secular. Uh, but they're growing faster. And so I think we've submitted comments to expand the definition of what's deductible from the HSAs, but you can imagine as people go to credit unions, not just banks, if more folks know about sharing communities, not just insurance companies, that's going to create real competition against insurers. What do you think about that? You know, so I think that, um, uh, I think federal tax policy should not discriminate in favor of certain arrangements over other arrangements, right? And we've long discriminated in favor of comprehensive health insurance. One, because we have Medicare, Medicaid, we have the government um, uh, healthcare programs, but also with the tax um, preference for employer-sponsored insurance, um, which is subsidizing uh, almost entirely third-party payment. 
So I like um, equalizing uh, uh, the tax treatment. And um, I, on, on this rule, what uh, the administration has proposed is uh, that people can use their HRAs um, as well as uh, uh, HSAs, as well as um, health sharing ministries um, uh, uh, can, can, can use it, it and um, uh, get the tax, uh, tax benefit uh, for those. There are some complications, like you, one of the, uh, on, on one of the realities with HSA uh, law is that you can't have a plan other than a high deductible health plan and uh, make HSA contributions. So uh, it is, um, I'm not sure how it's going to fit in that the health sharing ministry is going to sort of be considered a high deductible plan for people to make HSA contributions. It's just part of how that has to sort itself out if we give everything a chance to try to be sorted out. Dr. Tinsley, welcome, I see your hand. So actually back to your original question. So you can't use an HSA for a direct primary care doctor with the health sharing ministries only with the high deductible plans. You can use an HSA, an HRA. Well, so the rule proposes that a direct primary care is a qualified medical expense. So um, if that goes, if that's finalized, you could use your HSA or your HRA to purchase a direct primary care um, arrangement. However, they consider a direct primary care arrangement a health care plan. So you cannot make an HSA contribution if you have a direct primary care arrangement. I still don't get it. So, so you can use yes you can no. use you can use your HSA. If you have money in your HSA, you could uh -huh. use your money on an HSA for direct primary care arrangement, but you can't add money to the HSA. Can you, are you saying that you can spend out of my HSA to pay my monthly fee for the DPC or just services a DPC charges me for independent of my monthly cost? So the rule, so you can use your HSA or HRA on qualified medical expenses. Um, the proposal is the direct primary care arrangements would be a qualified medical expense. Okay. So you can use your HSA and your HRA to pay um, uh, for direct primary care, but you can't also make contributions in the future to your HSA if you have a direct primary care arrangement. So eventually you're gonna run out of money and you're done. Pretty much. So it's a, it's a, the, the, the administration, like they would like to um, allow people, like the policy is, the policy preference well, why would, would you be. Do, why would you go, to, why would you go donate direct primary care? Because eventually you're going to run out of money in that HSA and you'll never have another HSA. So Congress needs to change the law. That's what well, I'm saying. Why, why didn't they do it with this, uh, with the act that they just came, or, or Trump's uh, act? Why didn't they fix it with that? No, so they couldn't. A, um, according to their uh, legal review at Treasury and the IRS, um, they could allow uh, uh, they could allow direct primary care arrangements as a qualified medical expense, um, but they couldn't um, uh, allow people to make an HSA contribution because the way that they the way that you are limited to make an HSA contribution if you have any other health plan other than a high deductible health plan. And they say that um, direct primary care arrangement fits within any other health plan. Yeah, you're just, just it is just a change in the law because yeah, it makes, it's, makes no sense. Dr. Right. Campbell. So what you want, just I, I think um, what we want here is that anybody could have an HSA. So you can have an HSA and make contributions um, if you have a direct primary care arrangement. Um, and there'd be no problem with that. Uh, that you could, you know, there, there. You, you, you. I think the main, the my main uh, policy direction that I'd want to go with HSAs is to break the link between the requirement that you have to have a high deductible health plan to have an HSA. Well, I just want to make the comment that you're not going to fix this without guys like me. I'm a direct primary care family physician. 
we see a family physician can treat about 80 to 90 percent of the issues that I see. The current docs in the conventional system, they're cranking out 30 to 40 patients a day every 10 to 15 minutes. They don't have time to go shopping. They don't have time to do minimal health care. They're, they're, they're the spring doors to the specialists. You know, they're coming in, they're treating coughs and colds and anything more complicated is going to GI or ENT and there goes the cost of health care. So you're not going to fix it with the current system. You're just not. So let me give you, for instance, tonight, uh, I had a lady that uh, pharmacy was insisting on she pay $150 for resuvastatin, 10 milligrams, 90 tablets. I got it for her for $15. I got somebody a $900 medication for $90, a $325 medication for $15. I got a $2,500 MRI for $600, a $1,200 CT for $325. I mean, I could go on for another half an hour. You know, mainstream doctors, they don't do this. I do this. How are you going to fix the system without guys like me? You're not. You're not going to fix it. Not only that, who's going to want to try to be in the system in a different way? See how good you feel about what you're doing? You think those doctors spending 10 yeah. minutes on 30 people feel good? Yeah, no. I do it better. I do it faster. I do it cheaper. I'm a better doctor at 30 to 60 minutes a patient, which is what I do than I was at 10 to 15 minutes. I see them same day, next day, at 30 to 60 minutes. My, the first visit I see with them is an hour or two. I do it faster. I get them in the same day, next day. I do it cheaper, and that's obvious. I mean, I save people enough money that they get pretty much free memberships in my practice. That's awesome. So you can, cut us, you can cut us out of your plan, but you're not going to fix it without us. No, you're going to be vital. Dr. Campbell? Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Blaze. I, uh, I, I'm a practicing physician. I'm an anesthesiologist. I, after work, I come home and read things like the Council of Economic Reports and Health Affairs. I've read a lot of your stuff. A lot of it really pops. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, the, uh, you know, kind of like with what the DPC docs are seeing, all you got to do, I've been in this 32 years as a physician, and when you look around, the difference is now all the docs know this system is broke badly. And, you know, we either are going to have to change the policies or get like DPC docs empowered, get alternative insurance policies empowered, like you're talking. And you're really going to need like smart economic people like you, smart doctors, and somebody like President Trump, because I've never seen anybody in Washington outside of President Trump who's willing to take on all these special interests. So I applaud you for what you're doing. And I'm wondering if, you know, President Trump gets reelected, and I guess that's a long shot. Um, do you think he is ready to focus on health care? Republicans seem to run away from it. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, Republicans Republicans made a mistake after the failure in 2017 to just pretend that the, they could talk about things other than health care um, and be successful. And I mean, health care is, you know, the number one issue for, for many Americans. And uh, and there's a lot of good ideas that conservatives and free market uh, leaders have to free up uh, health care, to expand consumer choice, and really to get at a lot of the problems um, that have led to these huge uh, hospital systems and have put so much power in the hands of insurance companies. Um, so I do think, I mean, the president um, has made a big deal out of pharma and sort of in his rhetoric has been uh, very aggressive towards pharma. And I think, uh, honestly, he needs to sort of bring in uh, the rest of the healthcare industrial complex, the big hospital systems and the big insurance companies, because uh, there are, um, the, the, I mean, it is the, uh, the last couple of decades have seen a massive transfer of wealth from the American middle class to the healthcare industry. Um, yeah, I, and I, as you know, a lot of it has not gone to patient care onto bureaucracy, complexity, and administration. 
I think it's become more than just a healthcare problem. It's an economic problem. And I was really impressed when you guys wrote the last uh, Economic Reports Council to the president that you included the price of drugs as an important critical economic factor, not a healthcare policy, but it's affecting our economy. And I was on fluvastatin for the DPC docs and one year my copay went from $10 and the next year it went up to $150. Same drug, it'd been $10 copay for years, but what it is is the PBMs have these secret contract arrangements and it has nothing to do with fluvastatin suddenly as a third tier drug. It's totally out of my control, but you know, people, the system has so many financial perverse incentives. Uh, we have to reintroduce uh, free market policies and uh, I applaud you for what you do. And I, I hope you have lots of success getting these kinds of ideas uh, turned into real policy. So thank you. Thank you. Jeff, we've got time for one last question to slip in quick. Um. So, Brian, what do you think about the, the, the Medicare contractors out there? Do they create a problem for getting this thing fixed? The Medicare contractors? The folks that mean? handle all the Medicare, you know, it's, it's, it's all farmed out. Uh, the, 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 the folks that, that, that take over the private, you know, Medicare contracting reimbursement process. Um, there's, there's been quite a bit said about how inefficient they are. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, I'm probably, I, I, don't, uh, I don't quite know the role of the uh, Medicare contractors, but I do think the, uh, the system that we have in place, with how Medicare determines reimbursement rates and and also importantly figures out what's going to be reimbursed is uh, bureaucratic, slow to change, um, subject to uh, uh, special interest pressure and is one of the main problems that we have in our, uh, uh, in our healthcare system. I think the, the biggest problem is the lack of patient and consumer control. Um, that they're not spending their own dollars and that we've made it really difficult for consumers and employers to know how to shop healthcare. Um, but the role of Medicare in setting prices and determining what's going to be reimbursed, I think is the second big problem. So, so most of what I've seen is, is that Medicare is, 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 in, is really looked to to set the standard for what pricing is and everything else. And, um, but I think that what the administration needs to look at doing is, is how to create alignment between the employers and the physicians, because they both want to see their, the physicians want to see their patients get better. Employers have the same exact goals. They want to see their patient's health be as, uh, as good as it can be. And I think there ought to be some efforts on, you know, uh, creating that alignment because otherwise, I mean, you've got to have a strategy. And if, if you really look at that strategy, I think it's, it's something that could have a great impact. Very good. You know, when, one of the things just to close it out that you were commenting was the fact that they decide what gets reimbursed. And that right there is a kill because so much new things happen. How can they stay up on what's out there as opposed to just giving the person money, let them figure out with their doctor what they need and, new technology or whatever, then guess what? They get to decide. So, but Brian, that was fantastic today. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank, Thank you. you.